Madame Messeri, welcome to a new video by your Renekment advisor, Federico Marangoni. While uh, I record this video, it's mid-autumn. Uh, leaves are getting red on the trees, fog is getting thicker here in Bologna, and uh, in the air you can smell a perfume which uh, brings back memories of uh, Christmas expectation. It's the smell of Calda Roste, roasted chestnuts. And chestnuts are precisely what I want to talk to you about in this video. Fiunt quoque castane populares atque nobiles, que marona di cuntur, in copia infinita, in universo anni circuito abundante, tam civibus quam forensibus distribute. E multiformi terordinate, nostras familias refocilant abunde. These words come from a 13th century text. Um, it, the simple le medieval Latin translates uh, in English like this. Uh, chestnuts are grown in the countryside of Milan in two varieties. Some are called pheasants, others are called nobles, like the two uh, classes of the society. Uh, but the noble ones are also called marona, marroni, just like we call them now. Uh, it, it, it is the biggest kind of chestnut, uh, which is the most suitable to be roasted, actually. They are produced, the text continues, they are produced in great abundance during the year, and they are bought both by citizens and foreigners. These chestnut, chestnuts greatly feed our families. The man who wrote uh, these words in Milan at the end of uh, the 13th century, was Bonvesin de la Riva, a school teacher, Magister Grammatiche, and uh, an active member of the society, of Milanese society at that time. He wrote uh, a text called, uh, entitled, The Wonders of Milan, uh, where he describes uh, uh, all the positive things that Milan and its countryside had at the time. Uh, from its population to the great number of churches, of uh, wells, uh, uh, the uh, rich descriptions of a river, lakes, and so on in the countryside. And obviously, he talks about the wonderful richness of its agricultural production. About chestnuts, he continues describing how they were cooked and eaten. Chestnuts are roasted when still green, and they are eaten after the meals, at the end of the meals, instead of dates. He also states that chestnuts are better tasting than dates, in his opinion. Or they are peeled and boiled, uh, and people eat them with spoons, like in broth, like a soup. Boiled chestnuts are also used instead of bread. Uh, Sun-dried and slowly cooked chestnuts are instead given to ill people. So, there are different ways, we understand from the text that there are different ways of cooking and storing uh, the chestnut out. But the, he also says that in Milan uh, there would be not enough flour to, um, to, to feed everyone if chestnuts were not eaten instead of bread. So there are three ways of cooking and eating chestnuts. One way is roasting them just like we still do, uh, but we cook them ripe, not, not green, uh, ripe. Uh, roasted chestnuts are eaten at the end of meals. So uh, like uh, dates, as said in the text, or uh, actually like other kind of nuts, walnuts, for example, were often used at the end of meals. Another way, is boiling them and eating them with spoon, so like in a soup, as I said, while the third way is uh, drying them in order to make uh, uh, chestnut flour or to store them for a long time. 
and for this reason they are given to ill people to suck the chestnut slowly uh, and get strength from their nutritional value uh, already known at that time. So here we derive not just some gastronomical uh, information but also social information. The roasted chestnuts are eaten at the end of a meal so in addition to other things so for people who had some wealth uh, while uh, the boiled one are eaten uh, instead of bread so for people uh, without the, the money to buy bread for themselves. Uh, the dried one instead are given to uh, a third group of citizens, the ill ones. This information uh, come from a text from the 13th century, the last part of the 13th century, as I said, but they are confirmed by other sources, such as the famous 14th century text by uh, Pier de Crescenzi from Bologna, uh, whose uh, highly appreciated treatise about agriculture was copied in many copies uh, and printed also uh, several times uh, through, through the ages. He says that chestnuts are harvested unripe, uh, still in their husk, and then put in separated areas called ricciaie, because in Italy the husk, the, the external part, is called riccio, uh, well protected by, uh, from pigs, because uh, pigs used to be kept uh, quite free going here and there in the villages. Uh, Pier de Crescenzi states that uh, this way chestnut can be stored up uh, until uh, March. So several for several months since uh, the harvesting period for chestnuts is around October. Otherwise chestnuts were dried and smoked and in this case they were stored um, for two years, up to two years. This explains also how Italian chestnuts were exported abroad. We know that there were Italian uh, chestnuts, in fact, even on French markets. And chestnuts were a very important element of uh, the local economy in medieval times. We can understand it even from uh, uh, information given by city laws. In fact, in Pistoia, in Tuscany, in 1296, the city statue obliged people to stop their everyday work to contribute to the harvesting of chestnuts during the harvesting period. And we also are aware that big chestnut forests were in Piemonte, in Lombardy, in Emilia Romagna, uh, in most of the mountains area in Tuscany, in Lazio and so on. Uh, often uh, chestnuts were grown even uh, on the border of, of uh, fields and by law um, peasants and uh, farmers had to, to plant those trees uh, in that period. And finally we can find chestnuts in a series of a highly appreciated and reproduced um, book very um, often bought by rich readers of the 14th and 15th century not only in Italy but also in France in Germany and in various parts of, of Europe uh, those books are the so-called uh, Taquina Sanitatis uh, like the one you can see here in a modern reprint which was a transcription from a previous uh, Arabic text. Uh, those texts were meant not for professionals, not for doctors and physicians, but to provide information about uh, food and health for those who, who needed a simpler text, uh, for those who wanted to know something about uh, uh, food and their consequences on, on the body, but they were not doctors, they were not professionals. And in fact, in those manuscripts, we can find both wonderful images and short medical information about food connected to the theory of the four humors, which was the main uh, medical theory uh, about the structure of our body at that time. According to that theory, everything, and food as well, uh, was made of a mixture of four characters, of four uh, characteristics hot and cold, dry and wet, and uh, uh, those uh, characteristics were connected to uh, four liquids of our body. Uh, so certain food could have a good or bad 
effect on the body connected to its characteristics. Uh, now we will see four of the, uh, the most famous uh, Terpina Sanitatis uh, from four different uh, libraries uh, um, coming from the 14th century. Uh, we will see from uh, Casanatense Library in Rome, from Vienna and Paris National Library, and from the Municipal Library of Rouen in France. Uh, all those manuscripts have a, a page dedicated to castane, as the one you can see here, castane, so chestnuts in Latin. Uh, but there are some differences. Uh, not all the text, even if they come from the same source, uh, not all the texts have the same version. There, were, there are some differences. They all four agree uh, that chestnuts are of dry and hot nature and that they cause headache and stomach inflation. But there are two different versions about uh, the good effects of, of chestnuts. So, bad effects on the stomach and on the head. They are dry and they are uh, hot. But the Paris and Vienna manuscript say that they help the chest organs and they help you urinating. Moreover, they fight nausea and they increase appetite. These manuscripts suggest to prepare uh, the chestnuts, to prepare them roasted, uh, served with the good light wine, just like we eat them now, uh, with the Novello wine, Vino Nuovo, the, the, the wine which is the first produced after grape uh, harvesting. Uh, while the other two texts instead uh, state that chestnuts uh, have uh, good nutritional value and uh, movent coitum, which uh, in Latin means that they help sex. We usually do not consider chestnuts as an aphrodisiac, but uh, this is what medieval people thought. So maybe you can, you can try. Moreover, uh, those texts were often produced in Lombardy. Uh, at the end of the 14th century, there are several copies uh, around Europe which were produced in Lombardy. And this is probably why both the Rouen and Rome manuscript say that chestnut, the best chestnut mm, quality, come from uh, Brianza, a region in Lombardy. To fight the bad effects uh, in these two texts, uh, it is suggested to boil them, to boil the chestnuts, and so we find the other way here of cooking chestnuts described by Bonvezin at the beginning and one century before. So it is clear that uh, chestnuts were very important and very present in medieval kitchens. And uh, either you like them uh, boiled or roasted, either you get some headache from eating them or some sexual strength, uh, they're sure is a lot of history behind a chestnut or behind a castagna in Italian. So now, if you'll excuse me, I'll go prepare some more with the specific pen for caldarroste and maybe I will also have a sip of good light wine. Thank you very much. E arrivederci, Madame Messeri. So, thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked it, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, you can like my Facebook page or follow me on Instagram. And if you imagine how time consuming creating this video can be, then you can support me uh, by subscribing to my Patreon page or you can buy me a coffee or a beer uh, on my buy me a coffee profile where there are also some exclusive content for the supporters. All the links are in the description below. So uh, thank you very much and uh, Madame Messeri, arrivederci.